If not, then we're going to go into our worship. We're going to ask Brother Bruce Beebe, if he would, to lead us in a word of prayer. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this time that we can come together to sing songs of praise, to worship you and uh, honor you because you are such an awesome God. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. We thank you for uh, those that are joining us online and those that have uh, spiritual and physical needs uh, wherever they may be. We pray that you would bless this worship service to you uh, with honor and glory and praise and just uh, we love you for what you have provided for us in the way of your word and the knowledge of your son Christ Jesus. We ask that you would uh, help us to be aware of what we're singing and praying about and, and what uh, lesson we will have from uh, Brother Chris this morning. We ask all these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Also, I'm remiss in not mentioning, thanking those who are joining us online uh, due to situations that they couldn't be here, but we appreciate those who are with us online. Good morning. Our first song this morning is number 361 in our main hymn book, In His Time. I would just like to take a moment to, to thank John uh, Hafer. He put forth the effort to select our songs this morning and was planning on leading singing and decided that it might be best for he and Lorraine to, to stay home in the event that they were exposed to COVID. So we appreciate John and Lorraine and and uh, uh, he's, his effort this morning is helping us to worship. So shall we sing in his time? Number 168, prior to partaking of the Lord's Supper, shall we sing beneath the cross of Jesus. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land. A home within the wilderness, a rest upon the the burning of the 
us. Mine eye, it seems, can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my smitten heart with tears to wonders I confess the As we think about the song we just sang and expressing looking at the cross and seeing the Son of God dying on that cross, I'm often thinking about how his mother felt when she's standing there watching her son go through all the agony that can be felt in this life the pain, the suffering, knowing that she can see the blood that has been dripping from him. His back is just torn to shreds. He's not on a hewn board. It's not something that is just smooth. It's going to be bark. It's going to be something of, uh, that's not comfortable. Having to, to expand himself, to stand up, to just get enough room to breathe. Just can't imagine what he went through for us. Knowing that from time beginning, he knew he had to give himself as a sacrifice for that which he created. He lived a perfect life. Kevin has, been, has started the study in the book of Mark, and we're talking about the different things that Jesus did and the, the example that he was and the things that were placed upon him. Because he was God's son. And he had the power to overcome the things of this life. He had the power to overcome death itself. Before us are the emblems that remind us of what Jesus did and why. Because we know that without that sacrifice, we have no hope. There's nothing more in this life that is sad when you have no hope. Jesus gives us hope. Shall we pray? Our God and our Father in heaven, we are humbled that we can come before your throne 
to place before you our thoughts and our desires, our wishes, and for our expression of thanks for Jesus, for the things he did, for the things he taught, for the example he set, but ultimately for the sacrifice that he made for us. Help us to realize, Father, how blessed we are because we have a God that loves us and that has set a plan in place for us and also has set this memorial before us to remind us what has been given for us. We thank you for the bread and for the re what it represents. And we just pray that you would help us to have the right heart as we partake of it. And through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. pray. Our God, we once again come before, before you to thank you for the emblem which represents the blood of Jesus, the blood that seals our covenant with you, and the blood that was shed because of love for mankind. We thank you, Father, for your plan that you put into to place before time began. We thank you for the gift that Jesus brings to us. Help us, Father, as we partake. Help us to have the right heart as you would have us to have. We thank you again for Jesus, and through Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Our next song is Sweeter as the Years Go By, number 558. Following this song, we'll have our scripture reading this morning. 558. The thorns of Jesus' love that sought me when I was lost in sin of wondrous grace that brought me back to his fold again of heights and depths of mercy far deeper than the sea and As the years go by, sweeter as the years go by, richer, fuller, deeper, Jesus' love is sweeter, sweeter as the years go by. He tried. pathway long ago stuck people thronged about him his saving grace to know he healed the broken hearted and caused the blind to see and still selected to do the scripture reading, come on up. Phil. First Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 7. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and I deliver up, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. 
Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and cheers all things. Thank you, Sean. I'm sorry I didn't know who, who was supposed to do that. Our, our next song, which will be our song prior to the lesson this morning, is Joyful, Joyful. Um, number, song number 27, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. If you would like, shall we stand as we sing? Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melting clouds of sin and sadness drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with a light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of Vale and mountains, flowery meadow, flashing sea, chanting birds and flowing mountains, call us to rejoice in thee. Though our living throne, ever blessing, ever blessing. Wellspring of thy joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Mortals join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love winds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors to the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us onward in the triumph song of life. Please be seated. The song after the lesson this morning will be number 522 when the roll is called up yonder. This year we have been focusing on how to build a congregation that is ready for evangelism. Uh, and as we talked about wanting to be evangelistic, remember it wasn't so much as just simply saying, here are the techniques, here's what to do, or sermons that will guilt you into doing it, saying this is what you should be doing, as opposed to saying the foundation of having an evangelistic church is first and foremost having a church that people would feel comfortable being a part of. 
one that truly represents what the church of the first century looks like uh, or looked like and uh, being able to demonstrate that in such a way that as people come in and they are among us, they are able to see that we are a group that God is living in. Any church can become evangelistic, as in doing the right things, knowing the the right methods, but not every church will grow. What's required is a church that first loves each other, that demonstrates that love, that is willing and able to bring others into the group, to demonstrate that same love towards them. And to do that, the people within the church need to know how to get along with each other. Now, the last few weeks before I left in August, my focus was on the responsibility that elders have towards the church because a lot of the inner workings of a church have to do with the relationship between the leaders and the congregants. Well, we're going to flip the page just a little bit this morning, and uh, instead of talking about the relationship of the elders to the church This morning, we're going to really kind of bring all of this to a conclusion of sorts by talking about the responsibility that the members have to the various parts of the church as well. Before we, in a few weeks, begin to discuss the idea of evangelism itself. Good morning. It's good to be here this morning, isn't it? Especially knowing all the folks who weren't able to be here for various reasons and to know that uh, we lucky few are the ones who are able, well enough, uh, feel good, and are able to be here and aren't constrained in various ways. It's it's very good to be here with you, to be able to sing uh, these uplifting, encouraging songs by which we teach each other and instruct each other. It's great to have this opportunity to uh, proclaim the Lord's death together and to partake of the, uh, the memorial meal in which we remember what it is that our Savior has done for us, and that we remember the hope we have that comes through the resurrection. Uh, hopefully, as we open up the Word of God together this morning, we will all be encouraged and uplifted as we look at what I think is a pretty important aspect of what it means to be a church, And that is how it is that we get along with one another. Now, much of what we're going to be talking about is actually going to be summary of stuff we've already talked about through the year. Remember, we're bringing a lot of this discussion to a head. Uh, Therefore, I'm going to be doing a lot of summarizing. Hopefully, the things that I'm saying are going to sound familiar, and you'll say, well, didn't we already talk about that? Well, yes, we have. Uh, And hopefully that is what is brought to mind, uh, because the very first thing, remember the last time that that I had a lesson, I talked about the elders' responsibility to various aspects, to the church, to the other elders, to the evangelists. I want to do the same thing this morning as we talk about the individual's responsibility in those same areas. And first of all, that begins with the responsibility that we have towards one another, And if you can boil all of those responsibilities down into one simple concept, now I'm going to have more, but one simple concept, it is this, that we love one another. John 13, 35, you will be known that, or the world will know that you are my disciples by this, that you have love for one another. The distinguishing mark of, of a church. The distinguishing mark of Christianity is not that you come to worship on Sunday. It's not that you uh, sing songs a cappella. It's not that you uh, do this particular thing or you don't do this particular thing. You know, we have all kinds of things that we talk about, the distinctives of the church, but when it comes right down to it, as far as Jesus is concerned, and by the way, I'm not saying that those other things are unimportant, But what Jesus says, the most distinguishing fundamental mark of a church is this, it's how you treat each other. It's that you have love for one another. And not just that inwardly you think, oh man, you know what, 
I really like that Mary Martha. I'm glad that I have the opportunity to be around her. You know, it, it's not that. He says that the world should look at you and should see the love that you have for one another. It's not just an inward feeling that you possess towards each other, but it is an outward action that the world looks at and they say, yeah, look at that group. It is obvious by what I see them doing that they have love for one another. And I can't think of any better place to look at to see exactly what that love looks like or how that love is practiced than what was read for us just a few minutes ago in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, and contextually speaking, we're uh, at this point in the middle of a section in which Paul is answering the question that's posed to him, saying, hey, Paul, which one is the coolest spiritual gift? You know, which one's the best one? Uh, basically, what they're trying to do is create some type of hierarchy so that people who have the, the, the gift of speaking in tongues, they're like, that's the big one, right? And you know you've arrived if you're one of the ones who speak in tongues, and it's better than those others like knowledge and prophecy and, and all those others, because speaking in tongues really sets you, sets you apart. And Paul's like, you know, if you're using your spiritual gift to try to determine that you're better than someone else, then you've missed the point of what spiritual gifts are all about. Because if you're speaking in tongues, but you don't have love behind it, then you sound just like a cymbal solo. And I, I think I've probably said this before, but I played percussion in high school. I did a number of cymbal solos uh, myself, and that is basically taking the crash cymbals and going up to somebody and crashing them behind their back when they're unexpected. And not a single person ever was like, oh, wow, Chris, that was beautiful. Never happened. Not once. Now, I will say this. If you're in the midst of a song and everybody, the whole orchestra or band or whatever is doing it and you're, you're crescendoing up to a climactic moment in that song, and at that moment, you crash those cymbals at just the right time, and it explodes, it's amazing. The cymbals do an amazing job at that moment. One of the most overlooked, I think, pieces of equipment in an orchestra that really captures a moment. But they don't do so by themselves. See, that's what speaking in tongues without love is. Without the rest, of, without the important part, it, it's just a bunch of noise. And it doesn't even sound good because love is what really matters. And he goes on to say, look, this is what love really, truly is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Then he flips to the negative. Love is not envious boastful, arrogant, or rude. Then he goes back to the positive. This is what love does. I'm sorry, but love does not, it does not insist on its way. It is not irritable. It is not resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Now he flips to the positive. This is what it does. It rejoices with the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things, it hopes all things, and it endures all things. And I think it's important if we recognize Paul is not having a discussion here about how much God loves us. This isn't about the love of God towards us. This isn't even about the love that we have towards God. It's not that we trust God, we hope in God, we believe the best in God. We you know, think, think the best in the truth of God. No, this is how we interact with one another. Frail, faulty humans who make mistakes, who do things that are unwise, who cause problems. This is how we treat each other. It comes to my relationship with you, your relationship with me, our relationships with each other. That I bear everything that needs to be born that I believe all the great things about you. And, and if there's any kind of a question, 
I give you the benefit of the doubt. That I don't assume first the negative about you, but I assume first the best about you. And whenever needed, I am willing to endure whatever must be endured by our relationship, and I accept it. Without fault, without complaint. This is what love looks like according to the scriptures. And I will tell you this, that is not what love looks like to the world, especially in our 21st century Western, everything is about me and my rights culture that doesn't want to give in to anybody. Uh, You know, one of the most countercultural messages of our day, also from 1 Corinthians, goes back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And contextually there, Paul's talking about Uh, people who are taking Christians to court in order to settle their differences among each other. And Paul's like, you realize how ridiculous that is, right? Do you not have anybody there who is willing to adjudicate between you? No, arbiters are there that that can handle these disputes, that you have to go and air all your dirty laundry out amongst them and you can't handle anything amongst yourselves? He goes, that's stupid. In fact, he goes on to say there in chapter 6 and verse 7, you know, when it comes right to it, why not suffer wrong? Why not be wrong? Maybe you're in a situation where someone has done something to you and you're like, I got to get mine, I got to get even. These old balances are out of whack. I got to bring them back with justice. And he says, why not rather be defrauded? Why not be willing? to accept wrong from a brother without turning it into a big ordeal. And I think this is closely related. Instead of being the kind of people who always have to feel as if justice has to be served, the kind of people that if we are wronged, we want to make sure that that other person is wrong just as much to make sure that life is fair. Paul says, when it comes to your brethren, why not be wrong? Why not bear what is given why not show love in a radical way a radical way that's being forgiving and not demanding our own way every time because when we see each other and we're around each other and we find out that that we're in genuine sin with one another folks we have the means built in place to take care of this, which is why we're supposed to hold each other accountable. Yeah, we bear each other's burdens, but at the same time, we do so in such a way that if we know that there is sin, genuine sin that has taken place perhaps even against us, there's the protocol in Matthew chapter 18. We go to our brother in private. If there's no resolution, we take one or two with us to be witnesses of the discussion. Uh, who can help determine what needs to happen from there. If he still is deemed by all involved to be in sin and he refuses to change, we go to the church. The church reaches out to the individual, tries to help, and if that doesn't work, then we enact some kind of church discipline. But what if it works? What if we go to our brother? And our brother says, you know what? That was wrong. You're right. I messed up, didn't I? Well, it's incumbent upon us to forgive our brother, to show grace beyond measure, the same type of grace that was given to us. While at the same time, again, these are things hopefully that sound familiar to you. At the same time, it's important to remember that what I or you consider to be sinful based on our understanding of God's commands might be different for someone else. And it's important that we understand that can be the case. There are some matters that need to be handled differently. And these matters, after talking to a brother, looking at the Bible with them, if we can see they genuinely believe their stance based on their understanding of the Word of God, even if that stance differs from what you or I might believe, Or you can tell the word simply maybe doesn't just cover that particular issue that Paul's dealing with first century issues. 
And what we're trying to do is extrapolate the principles and apply them in our time, and maybe the, the principle applies differently in my mind than it might apply to yours, and it's not something that's just absolutely explicit, then this is the point where we observe or we assume the best in the other individual and we say, okay, I'm going to leave that between you and God. This is Romans 14, 1 Corinthians. Again, Paul talks about this, 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 10. Passages in which there is one side that really does believe there is a sin that's taking place. Sometimes these passages get kind of scooted off to the side. We say, well, Paul, he's just talking about matters of opinion and not matters of faith. Folks, for at least one side in both of these discussions, this is a matter of faith. This is a matter of sin or not. Somebody in the Gentile world who then becomes uh, a Christian, but he believes that meats that are sacrificed to idols are worshiping that idol to him, if he eats that meat, knowing that it's sacrificed to an idol, he is sinning. Or, as Paul talks about in Romans, if you have a Jew who believes and firmly believes that he is not supposed to be eating unclean meats, and he firmly believes that that's what God has commanded, then to him to eat that meat is a sin. That's the words that Paul uses. It's a sin for him to do so, even if it's not a sin for someone else. There are matters that our own conscience can make something a sin that really isn't a sin to someone else. We have to accept that. We have to realize that, and we have to allow that maybe, just maybe, I can give them the benefit of the doubt. And they have a good standing before God, even if they disagree with me on this subject or that subject. Remember what Paul told the Corinthians? He says, look, I tell you what, if my eating meat is going to cause my brother to stumble, I'll become a vegetarian. I have no problem with that. Because I would rather never experience the true absolute joy of smoked ribs again, I'd rather give that up than to see my brother enter into hell. More important for him, the conscience of his brother, than his personal enjoyments. That's the kind of attitude of love that should be on display. As Christians, we should be loving each other in such a way that we give each other the benefit of the doubt. When we have disagreements, we're willing to allow the other person to hold their, disagree the, the, their view that we disagree with, to hold that before God and let God be the judge. Now, obviously, there are so many other things I could put up here. I'm doing a summary. Some of the stuff that uh, is important aren't a part of this, but I do want to move on in our consideration to talking about the responsibility of the sheep to the shepherds. Now again, I'm summarizing what we have already stated. In fact, this should be pretty fresh in your mind because this discussion really is about a month old. It was just about a month ago or a little over a month that we went through uh, these discussions about an individual's responsibility to the elders. And really, it all boils down to what you find in Hebrews 13 and verse 17 where he says, Obey your leaders. Again, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, because that would be of no advantage to you. Again, hopefully this is fresh in your mind, even though uh, the, the word elders or shepherds or overseers, none of those words are actually used there in Hebrews chapter 13, I think it's still safe to say that the application of leaders goes to those in the first century who were leading the churches, and that's clearly the eldership. I have no problem understanding that the author means elders when he says this. Um, therefore, our responsibility towards the elders, we should be very careful how we walk. And this goes back to our discussion with how we interact with one another. 
um, because we hold mindsets today because the world around us holds these mindsets that are just so incredibly individualistic. You know, especially as, as we're entering into, or maybe some of you might say we're just smack dab right in the middle of a postmodern society. Uh, postmodernism is a, it, it's a fundamental belief without getting into all the details, but what it basically says is we reject that there is an absolute truth that exists for every person. Therefore, you define what your own truth is, is kind of the idea. And it rejects things uh, such as a, a meta narrative like Christianity or other things such as that, um, that that says the whole of this group is applied to everybody. That's where we are right now. We're highly individualistic people. And what we say is, it's all about me, it's all about I, it's all about number one. And if that's the case, then do we even care if the elders are going to have to give an account for us? I mean, if we're just so steeped in this idea of, well, you know what? Nobody has the right to come into my business and tell me what to do. I can decide for myself how I'm going to live. Thank you very much. Do we care that at some point God is going to come to the elders and, and they're going to say, you know, look at how it is that you dealt with Chris and look at the way that he acted. That's the whole basis of what's taking place here. A wholly selfish mindset would completely dismiss that anyone else is affected by our actions, that our decisions could impact someone else negatively because all we're focused on the highest uh, I guess you could say virtue of our society is my own happiness, fulfillment, pleasure, which, my friends, is a very selfish and sinful mindset. Because here's the problem. You are just one individual among many. Your views represent you. And maybe some other people might share your views on this, that, or the other, but they are your views. And if the church is established as just kind of a strict democracy, you know, one man, one vote, everybody here, their views are uh, just as important, just as weighty, that they're just the same as everybody else's, well, we're going to have problems, struggles between members, and especially between the members and the elders, this is where things often completely go awry. And again, it's because we're so entrenched in a democratic view of beliefs that my, my belief is just as valuable as anyone else's. Who are you to tell me that my view is inferior to someone else's? And we bring this mentality into the church, and here's the reality, and, and this, is, this is a gut check, maybe for some people, that's not true. We are not a democracy within the church. Your view, my view, people's view, views across the board are not just as important and not just as legitimate as anyone else's view. And I think it's important that we understand that fact. There is not equality across the board within the church where everyone's views are weighted equal because the church was not set up as a democracy in fact nothing back then was really set up as a democracy per se it is set up as a meritocracy if we want to give it a name where the leadership is placed in the hands of the people who have already proven themselves capable and wise to lead you know some of these young guns who are down here, young whippersnappers throughout the congregation, they might be pretty smart. And they might know a thing or two for their age. But what they don't have is years of experience backing up what they know, what they understand about the world, what they understand about the way that things work. They may have grown up in the church but they haven't seen life the way that others have. 
That's why we seek out a group of people that is first and foremost known as what? Elders. These are not young bucks. There's a reason that we go to the aged, to the ones who were the people who sat at the gates of the city in the Old Testament. And by the way, not just anyone sat at the gates of the city in the Old Testament. They didn't view everybody's view just as important and equal as anyone else's. They said, hey, these men right here have proven themselves to be wise. Therefore, we will go to them to learn from them and gain their discretion and their wisdom. And I'm not, as much as I think Jonathan is smart and capable, I'm not going to go to him for life advice. Sorry, Jonathan, I don't know if that surprises you. This, this is the first time I've told him that. But it probably should go without saying, right? Nobody's going to go to Jonathan or Sean or to Ben or to some of these other individuals and say, I want to learn how to live based off of what I see in you and your experience. Maybe someday. Maybe someday down the road, these very gentlemen right here are going to sit at the gate, proverbial gate for a church, and serve as elders within a congregation, and men will come to them, but that day is not right now. Maybe someday their opinion and their view and their thought is going to hold a lot of a weight, but that day is not right now, because that's not the way the system is structured. We seek out the elders of the church, those who have demonstrated their ability to shepherd, those who have shown wisdom in how they oversee, and those elders, yes, their opinion on matters is weightier than the opinions of others. And I hope we realize that the reason that their opinion is weightier is not because they are elders. Their opinion is not weightier because they hold the office of eldership. Folks, they hold the office of eldership because we already realize their opinion is weightier. Let me repeat that. The reason their opinion is weightier is not because they hold the office. They hold the office because we recognize their opinion is weightier. They have proven to us that we can trust their judgment, we can trust their leadership, and they are placed in a position of leadership to guide, and what is often the case is they are respected and followed without issue until what happens? Until what they say differs from what someone or many people in the congregation actually want. You know, here's an age-old illustration, and uh, you've probably heard this before, seen this before, or whatever the case. Um, it, it's actually pretty old at this point, but there was a man who had a, a parcel of land, and as he died, he said, told his son, here's the land, here's what I want you to do with it as my parting wish. I want you, you have four quadrants here, and one quadrant I want you to plant corn. Um, they don't really do corn out here, right? That's, that's kind of more, you know, somewhere else. But you all know what corn is, I'm assuming. So one place I want you to do corn, another place I want you to do wheat. I probably could, should have found things for this that were more here, uh, filberts or something, right? Anyway, Plant corn, plant the wheat. He says, by the river, I want you to, or this creek, not really a river, creek that runs through it, I want you to put the barn uh, so that you have easy access for the animals and such. And then finally, this last place is for your house. Well, the man dies, and the son's like, okay, I'll do what my father wants, except I really don't think that this is the best place for the barn. I'd much rather that the house be there because when I get up, I want to be able to go to the stream. And but again, old, really, really old illustration before indoor plumbing, probably, and all of that. I want to be able to go and get my water and everything else from there. And this would be a whole lot easier. And the question then becomes did he obey his father? Well, no, right? I mean, he obviously he switched up those. But at least he obeyed over here, didn't he? I mean, he put the corn where his father wanted, the wheat where, where his father wanted. At least he obeyed over there, right? No, he didn't. Because the illustration demonstrates already 
what if he thought, what, what if he had thought, you know, I think this is a better place up in this quadrant for the wheat and this is a better place for the corn. What would he have done? He would have followed whatever he decided needed to be done. There was no, there was zero obedience taking place here. In every aspect he said, yeah, that's what makes sense to me or I'll do what makes sense to me. This is the problem of leadership oftentimes. As long as the group says, yeah, I buy that, I agree with that, I can follow that, that makes sense. Things are hunky-dory, but the moment that you get to a decision that is controversial, that causes problems, that people don't agree with, that's where things get real. Our relationship with an eldership has to be one of trust. That even if we find that we disagree with them, we give the eldership the benefit of the doubt that what they're doing is for the benefit of the group, even if we don't personally agree with them. You know, so many problems arise when people begin to distrust their leaders. And this really <laughs> was seen uh, with a lot of the churches, a lot of the problems that churches face during COVID and its aftermaths. And I know people are probably getting tired of hearing COVID discussion. A lot of people just want to leave it in the past, but I think you need to prepare yourself to hear this a lot because we just went through something monumental and right now we're still processing the lessons that we learned from it and as we process we're going to be talking about it and bringing it up um, so we need to be prepared to hear a lot of this as we look back and process what happened and where so many problems that, that face churches seem to be about how to handle it, did, did, whether churches either did or did not adhere to governmental regulations, people even comparing it to the persecution, such as uh, Nebuchadnezzar telling the Jews that they must bow down to the, the statue. You know, I think, as BJ, I think it's BJ, I might be wrong, there's a lot of people who have been uh, spoken here over the summer, but I think it was BJ recently suggested, the problems during COVID was not always about COVID. COVID just simply brought to the forefront problems that already existed. In other words, the divisions were already there under the surface. The distrust of elderships was already there festering under the surface. The lack of trust with leadership was already present, even if not understood. All it took was an issue to bring those problems to the surface. And this is why it makes the scenario a great test case for what we're talking about. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. If anyone here made some kind of decision during COVID for one reason or another, I'm not attempting to condemn that behavior at all. There are some scenarios in which that was probably necessary. It was the right move to make. I'm not making blanket statements here for everybody, but for the most part, a lot of the problem came down to this do you trust your leadership or not? Remember, the leadership in a church, whether the problems due to COVID or other matters that, that could divide, the leadership in the church has a really difficult road because they have to consider everybody's viewpoint. They have to take into account not just what I believe, but what everyone else believes at the same time. And when you have two, three, four views that are held, and everyone who holds one of those two, three, four views, they feel they are 100% right according to the scriptures, which happens because we're dealing once again with things not specifically outlined in scripture, just regulated by principles which tend to be subjective. How does the eldership choose? They have to come together to make a choice based on how they understand the situation according to Scripture. And again, their view carries more weight because they have demonstrated a greater grasp. That's why they're the teachers in the church. That's why they've placed them as overseers. They are the elders because we trust they have a more mature understanding of the text and the church but they also have to make decisions based on how to navigate difficult waters with the least amount of problems. In other words, we have to trust that the men who serve as elders just simply know more information than 
I know. Then you know. Then we know. They know everybody's opinions on the matter that we don't because they've heard it all. They know why people hold the views that they do. They know how, how to handle the situation so that nobody feels marginalized or ignored. And as careful as they try to be, they have to make decisions. And those decisions are going to be some that somebody will not agree with. Some people, as careful as they are, will feel marginalized or ignored, which means they have to be fully engaged in damage control at the same time. All of this to say, as the Hebrews author says, you can either submit to their leadership in a way that will cause a harmonious situation or you can live in such a way that's going to cause groaning from them and it's not going to be good for you. This is why it's important for us to consider how we are to deal with the, upper, uh, uh, with the elders who shepherd us. We have entrusted them with leadership, therefore we must allow them to lead, recognizing they're in that place for a reason. Now, again, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying, suggesting that just because they're in leadership, that means they become infallible, that they'll always make the right decision. They probably won't, because they are fallible, they're not deity. But I think that's also why there's a plurality. <laughs> that's why you have more than one. You have a system of checks and balances that's built in right there. The collective group helps each other so that hopefully the right decisions rise to the top. Therefore, he says, submit to them. But as Paul also tells Timothy, hold them accountable. If there are problems that exist, there's a recourse for handling that. And I think the problems that's under discussion is not, have they taught something that I think is wrong? What is their view on X, Y, or Z? I think it has to do with abusing their power. It has to do with how they treat people. It has to do with them uh, abusing their position and lording it over everyone else, or abusing their power in a situation with one individual that maybe nobody else even knows about. Whatever the case, if there is an issue in that regard, they have to be held accountable too. Nobody is above the law. And you bring that, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 5.19, he says, yeah, Timothy, it's your job as the evangelist to deal with this on the basis of two or three witnesses. In this way, the evangelist can serve as a way to determine the legitimacy of the claim and whether there's need for further action. But overall, the responsibility of members to the elders rests in the action of submission. And then finally, the uh, individual's responsibility to the evangelist or evangelists of the church. Um, this one, it's a difficult discussion to have while actually being relatively easy because, frankly, there's not much responsibility that's outlined. There's just not much there. Um, apart from perhaps the right of the evangelist as a laborer to receive wages, Paul talks about that, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, to receive monetary compensation. Um, but it's not necessarily obligatory. I mean, Paul goes on to say, but I don't receive that. As noted a moment ago, the evangelist is the means by which actions against elders are taken, if needs be. But really, Timothy, as an evangelist left by Paul in Ephesus, is told not to allow the church to dismiss him because of his youth. That's uh, 1 Timothy 4.12. And given that Timothy is probably, maybe just a, a smidge younger than I am, he's probably around 40 years old or so, um, I, I suppose I could still be considered young, just barely, hanging on to it by my fingernails for as long as I can, though Mike or Dale might tell you my fingers are slipping just a little bit, and I'm fast approaching being an older preacher. But as much as I have the responsibility to be an example for the church in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, the church has as much of a responsibility to imitate the walk that I teach. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. We talked about this on Wednesday. Uh, Just as it is my responsibility as an evangelist to use the God-breathed scriptures to exhort with teaching, to reprove, to rebuke, inherent in that is that the church has just as much responsibility to listen and to change when confronted by the word of God that I present. In reality, though, very, very little is expressed stating the relationship between the church members and the evangelists, so I really don't have a whole lot to say here. But with this, we have a non-exhaustive treatment concerning the church members' responsibilities to the church, whether it be a responsibility to each other, to the leadership, to the evangelist. And I say it's non, not exhaustive because there's no possible way and one lesson for us to be exhaustive on this. But hopefully the principles discussed can carry out to some degree the rest of the sphere and, and, and dictate how we treat each other. Because it's not so much about having a passage that says do this or don't do that. How we treat each other is less about commands, saying to treat each other this way or that way, as much as it is about being the kind of person that the New Testament outlines that we should be, which is defined by how we treat each other. And I hope you can see the difference. Let me say that again. Who we are is less about following the commands given on what we do, and it's more about the principle of loving each other and what that looks like. To illustrate this, I'm not called to practice the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's not that these are a checklist that I'm supposed to wake up and do every day. The point is that we become Christians. And as Christians, that's the fruit. It's what's grown. It's what naturally is produced. We're supposed to become the kind of person who does not obey the command to love his brother, but we are so deeply rooted in Christ that we naturally love our brother as Christ loved us. And when we can achieve that level of mutual love, respect, goodness, patience with one another, we will have the kind of church that reflects who Jesus is in the world the kind of church that, quite frankly, others will want to be a part of. Let's pray together. Our great and almighty Father in heaven, you are amazing and worthy of all praise and adoration. We love you because you first loved us and you have shown us what love is. And we stand in awe of you and your grace and your goodness given to us. Help us to extend the same grace, the same goodness to the church we are a part of, and bless us as a church as we interact with one another, that, that we would extend to each other the same patience and kindness that you have shown us, especially as it's shown through your Son. We thank you for Jesus and the hope we have through him, and through Jesus we pray. Amen. It is important to remember, as we spend some time talking about our relationships that we have with each other, as we talk about the leadership of the church and how the church works and what the church does and what the church looks like and everything about the church, it is important that we remember the primary focus of Christianity is not the church. It's Christ. The primary focus of Christianity is not about the distinctives about us. It is about the God who sent his son because he loved us that kind of a way. The focus and the the attention of everything is on our Savior, who is our King, and who reigns. This morning, if you are here and... Jesus does not reign for you. You've never submitted to him. You've never been baptized into his blood. You've never been cleansed by the blood of Christ. 
And if you are here this morning and you recognize that you need to be baptized into the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, we're going to sing a song in just a moment. <clears throat> and that song is when the roll is called up yonder. As we sing this song, if you recognize and you know that that role is going to be cold and you want to hear your name, you want to know that you are there with Christ through eternity and you're ready to be baptized into the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, as we sing this song, simply come to the front, have a seat, and we'll assist you. If we can help you in any way, please come forward now as we stand and we sing for your invitation. saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder 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 I'll be there that bright and glorious morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Please have a seat. Well, Wanda has come to the church because she is going through an awfully difficult moment in her life with her whole family, really. Um, a lot of death that has taken place, even a grandson who has recently passed away. And uh, whereas I know that there are a lot of people here um, who have experienced these types of issues, you know the hurt we know the struggle, and what Wanda desperately needs is uh, encouragement and strength. And so she comes to the place where she knows she can find that, and that is a group of the Lord's people. Um, we're going to pray for Wanda in just a moment, Dale, if you wouldn't mind leading us in that prayer. Um, and uh, yeah, let's try to give Wanda the encouragement that we're able to give as she is going through this really difficult moment in her life. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you humbly. We come to you as our God, as our creator. 
as the one who sustains everything that we know and that we hope for. We thank you for life and the many, many blessings that you give us each day. That being said, we know that life is sometimes a struggle, sometimes overwhelming, sometimes hard to bear. And we are grateful for the help of one another. We ask that you would be with Wanda this morning and as the days go by, that she would find comfort in you and your son, that she would somehow find the strength which can only come from you to deal with things in this life. Also, we would ask that you help us to get to know her, to do what we can to fulfill her needs, so we might all work together to glorify you and to look forward to, the, to that better home that you've promised. And we pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Just before we are dismissed this morning, I just want to say thank you to Chris for all the, all the uh, encouraging things he has said about our relationship as it has been designed by God. When he first started this series, talking mostly about elders, he he referred to a book called They Smell Like Sheep. That book's talking about elders. I took great offense to that. But you know what? This morning I realized that that odor, or maybe I should say aroma, comes from you. What a family we have as God has designed it. We invite you all to be back at uh, 5.30 tonight. We'll continue our uh, overview of the Bible, and we're going to be dismissed now with a, with a word of prayer. Brother Cliff is going to lead us. Let us pray. Our blessed and holy and merciful Father in heaven, we are we approach your throne of grace at this time with thanksgiving in our hearts for this opportunity that you have given us to come together, an opportunity to praise your name, to sing praises unto you, to study your word, and to be a part of a family. We are we are thankful, dear Father, that you have sent your Son and that he was willing to suffer the shame of the cross on our behalf, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We pray, dear Father, that you will go with us as we leave this place, and that we go into the world and we might be an influence to others who are out there. We pray for those who are not with us this day that are away from town, those who are sick and afflicted with other ailments. Uh, we pray that you will have mercy on them and that you will help them in their strive for health. Again, we pray for Wanda and we pray for uh, her and her situation and that you will lift her spirits and help her to, to uh, see her way forward. Forgive us of our sins, dear Father, for we know that we do stumble. And we pray that you will continue with us throughout this day and bring us back at the next appointed time. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.